Um, and to be honest, connectomics kind of took a bit of a pause for the better part of 20 years um, after that. Um, and it was actually thanks to our first speaker, Moritz Helmstetter, and his mentor, Winfried Denk. Um, they were really instrumental in the rebirth of connectomics as a modern, um, modern science. So Moritz has had uh, an incredible run of science contributions and career advancement since then. Um, and he's now uh, director so for some years now at the Max Planck Institute for Brain Research in Frankfurt. Um, so over to you, please, Moritz. We're looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much for this very kind uh, introduction. And it's a great pleasure to be here and talk about connectomics from our point of view, which is um, focused very much on the cerebral cortex and which uses techniques involving electron microscopes. But before describing this uh, strategy of approaching brains circuits and their use, I want to briefly set up why I think it's so important to do connectomics at the synaptic level and uh, analyze circuits that store information about the world in relevant ways. So many objects and phenomena in our world um, are, have been around for a long time, millions of years. So certainly on time scales that allow, in principle, these kinds of phenomena to have consequences on our genomes and by genomic information be implemented into our neuronal circuits in terms of what can be expected in the world. Obviously, gravity, movement of objects, smell are phenomena that uh, have been around on these timescales of millions um, of years. But then there are, of course, also phenomena um, that we all experience that are certainly not as old and that certainly do need uh, to come into our brains, so to say, during our lifetimes and more generally during individual lifetimes. And it is both of these kinds of information about uh, our world that uh, we think end up in our connectomes, one via the genomic pathway and one by direct learning, if you want. And if you want to make this very simplistic, this differentiation, you could argue there is, if you want, uh, there are evolutionary traces in our connectome. These could be rules of wiring, etc. And then there are individual traces that need to be added uh, especially for more complex um, organisms. And then all of this information now shown on the left side enters, uh, after having entered our connectomes, is able to be combined by our connectomes, that is our neural circuits, with current sensory data from the world, visual, perceptive, sensory, um, uh, auditory, to then take conclusions, identify objects, make predictions about the world, identify interesting uh, phenomena that are happening right now. And it is this combination of knowledge or prior information with current sensory data, uh, in, in my view, that is really particular about the performance of the nervous system. And when we think about today's AI, then uh, we know quite well how to train it heavily um, uh, and then make use of it. But the efficient encoding of models about the world, both by uh, circuit structuring with already the expectation of certain phenomena and by, if you want, memory encoding of more recent or more transient phenomena. And then the combination of that with sensory data is something that I think nervous circuits do extremely well. And this is uh, what I would set up as the strategy for um, potential better AI via connectomics uh, from our point of view. And it is clear already from that simple argument that we need to look at the circuits at synaptic level because as far as we know, um, evolutionary mechanisms of circuit structuring could be implemented by cell types. But um, data, memories, knowledge about what happened in my own life is, as far as we know today, most certainly implemented by uh, the, cha the change of single or many single synapses. So we need to uh, look at circuits uh, at that level in order to determine um, uh, the, these contributions to neural processing. A final introductory comment is about the evolutionary aspect of this, because what I just described as um, genomically encoded circuit versus individually shaped circuits is something that dramatically changes over the course of the evolution. Not so much the, the representation space of the genome, but certainly the representation space of the connectome. So in other words, the amount of uh, connectomes that could be in principle assumed by a given uh, brain uh, uh, rises dramatically. So the y-axis is double log 10 scale rises dramatically across evolutionary scales. And interestingly, and with this I will conclude my introductory remarks, um, this is only true if you look at each nerve cell separately. 
If instead you look at what we would call the cell type connectome, that is the connectivity between identified neuronal types, then this uh, encoding space is not necessarily so dramatically increasing over species and uh, over evolution. So you could argue in this very simplistic view that I've just presented that uh, the genetically determined part of the connectome uh, could be in principle covered by cell type connectome description. But if you want to also add information about what individually has been learned and understand how that individual component of uh, learning contributes to sensory and other processing, then you will have to look at uh, these other parts of the circuit, which are beyond the cell type connectome. And these proportions dramatically increase, especially then in mammals and higher mammals. So with these uh, setups, I would like to discuss now our strategy for EM-based, electron microscopy-based connectomics that uh, has evolved over the last about 20 years. And that is chiefly based on the fact that we need to reconstruct morphologies, cable shape, cable continuity, branching cables to reconstruct connectomes from morphological data. This, of course, um, is one approach, and we'll hear about exciting uh, alternative approaches later today. Um, but as long as we uh, want to use the cable-based synaptic level description of the circuit, then we need to actually follow these cables, image and follow the, these cables in 3D. For this, we take essentially biopsies of brain tissue, embed the material in plastic, make sure there are enough heavy metals around, so to say, in the structures we want to image in the electron microscope. And then one of the key techniques so far that was the first one in the modern age of connectomics, if you want, introduced by Winfried Denk more than uh, or about 20 years ago, is uh, shown here um, as a representative of three-dimensional electron microscopy, as we would call it today, um, with the ability to image uh, this specimen here from the surface of the tissue block and then have some way of uh, getting rid of the just image tissue, in this case by a diamond knife that abrades the top about 25 nanometers and then uh, another image is taken. This, of course, 24-7 over many months uh, to get the data set sizes we need. And this we first applied to the uh, uh, retina of mouse um, and in a way that is the first uh, mammalian uh, connectome that we obtained at the time with about 10, uh, sorry, about 1,000 nerve cells um, shown here, photoreceptors, uh, bipolar, amacrine, and ganglion cells that uh, provide the first sensory processing of, in this case, visual information in the mammalian brain, where, as we all know, the photoreceptor inputs are converted into more complex, if you want, filtered versions of the pixelated world um, carried by the ganglion cells via the optic nerve to the rest of the brain. And the generation of these filtered visual responses happens in this inner plexiform layer of the retina. And by reconstructing uh, these about 1,000 nerve cells and all of their contacts, um, we were able to provide this uh, yeah, connectomic description of such a first sensory processing layer uh, in the mammalian brain. Um, this at the time was already done by a combination of uh, human and machine uh, analysis and uh, at the time already a uh, first uh, starting point of AI, heavy usage of AI for um, the processing of such kind of data. And uh, that was then compiled into what we today uh, call connectomes. I would ask someone to tell me in case you are not seeing uh, uh, this movie. So the generation of the con okay, uh, uh, connectome uh, at the time um, uh, was uh, was uh, what we had planned for to analyze these simple visual circuits. Now, uh, relating back to what I said in the beginning, I think this is an example of geno uh, genomically encoded um, circuitry. So by all we know, uh, the detection of, for instance, direction of movement, the direction selectivity circuit, which was one of the first circuits we looked at at the time, but also all the other about 30 filtered responses of the visual input in the mammalian retina uh, are very, very likely mostly genetically encoded circuitry. Cell types made to link together in a way that we can understand in terms of visual processing, filter generation. And I think if we think about it uh, in this uh, evolutionary versus individual learning, this is uh, most likely something that has uh, been ev evolved over evolutionary time scales. Um, now, in order to come to individually learned circuitry, um, we focus uh, currently on the mouse cortex, uh, pr primary somatosensory cortex here, in this case, the whisker cortex, um, very well known also 
in the term of barrel cortex, where especially um, in this cortex, the notion of the cortical column is very visible because the thalamic input comes to layer four of cortex and there creates uh, clustered representations of sensory input. And again, here we can now ask a bit uh, more in, in more detail how um, uh, both the processing of sensory information uh, is encoded or is carried out by our connectomic uh, circuits, so to say, or circuits, and how uh, sensory experience may shape these circuits at the same time. And this we exemplified by work um, that was uh, published about two years ago, where we took a very small piece of cortex, densely reconstructed it with uh, all the nerve cells in there based on EM-based uh, uh, data. Um, not just the cells, which are only a few percent of the path lengths, but especially the axons, which are meters of path length, and then constructed this uh, cortical connectome sized a few thousand times a few thousand, and uh, were then using this kind of cortical data to ask about possible traces of individual learning. And this now may seem a little bit unintuitive that you can take connectomic data, a circuit, a snapshot, a temporal snapshot of circuit structure, and still ask questions about what part of the circuit is likely, um, if you want, genetically encoded in terms of cell type specificity versus what part of that circuit is um, at least possibly the result of individual learning. And as we know, individual learning has been associated with a phenomenon called uh, uh, Habian or learning and, and molecularly uh, identified with the term long-term potentiation and uh, depression in some way. Um, so if we focus on this notion of long-term potentiation, then it had been uh, noticed uh, earlier on, especially by Kristen Harris and colleagues, that pairs of synapses are very interesting. Why? Um, Habian learning assumes that learning or more precisely synaptic weight change is associated with the electrical activity of pre and post synaptic neurons. In particular, the proposal that when the presynaptic neuron contributes to the post synaptic neurons activity, then these synapses between them should be strengthened. Now, the particular configuration of pairs of synapses are extremely relevant because in these, we can even in a snapshot of um, a connectome study whether synapses are consistent with this kind of heavy learning model. Why is that so? Well, the simple prediction is that electrical activity in the presynaptic axon, of course, would be the same between the two synapses of a pair of synapses. And then together with the timing predictions, you would argue that synapses grow together if LTP conditions are fulfilled or shrink together if LTD conditions are fulfilled. And LTP with a uh, rise in synaptic weight is predicted to then make these synapses not just larger, but also more similar. And this is something we can analyze because we can now look at pairs of synapses and ask whether they are overly similar when they are large or overly similar when they are small. So in this simple um, depiction here of synaptic strength, y-axis is strength and x-axis is similarity between pairs of synapses and their weights, we can find or identify regions in which uh, LTP synapses will uh, reside and LTD synapses will reside. And by measuring thousands of these configurations, we were able to compare this to the random case and then identified regions of uh, uh, this plot here. In other words, pairs of synapses here shown in green that are likely the result of LTP or at least consistent with LTP and those that are not. And that's very important. We can measure for the first time, we think um, the fraction of the circuits that can possibly be learned by these mechanisms of individual learning and those that are not compatible, at least not with a saturated and fully um, uh, performed LTP process. And that is, I think, uh, quite critical. Obviously, it's a very first step. Uh, it's far away from reading the content of this kind of shaping, but being able to at least determine which part of the circuit, as shown here in purple, is even compatible with individual learning is, I think, a step uh, in that direction. Um, and uh, this is uh, briefly visualized here again, uh, the density, obviously, of the data, um, uh, the, you know, dense packing of neurites that we find in all of these neural pills, and then the identification of the synapses that can likely be learned or not. 
Um, in the final uh, very few minutes, uh, I want to focus briefly on another aspect that I find uh, relevant for uh, what in particular we can learn from nervous uh, circuits, neural circuits and brains about potential improvements in AI. And I will really have to summarize this very briefly with the brief interruption earlier, but the key point here is that inhibition is something that so far AI has not embraced, at least not to uh, any substantial degree, and is something that we need to understand, I think, and might be a source of very relevant computational um, uh, properties that, that we could at some point potentially use. Um, in especially mammalian brains, inhibition is dedicated uh, to certain types of neurons. Uh, it's not the same neuron that can be excitatory and inhibitory, which of course in other species is well possible, which leads obviously in the first uh, instance to a decrease of overall uh, neuronal activity because you can encode with a sign times uh, activity. But there's another aspect of this inhibitory wiring that we found a few years ago uh, in which we found that the circuits are shaped very uh, precisely in a triadic fashion where inhibition is always activated first. So by placement of synapses along axons, um, and really I have to summarize this very briefly, this is published work, but I want to focus on this triadic circuit structure here where excitatory neurons, whenever they target the next excitatory neuron population, first make contact with inhibitory neurons that then project very efficiently to that same excitatory target. In other words, a gating circuit that we could at least show in principle could be a shut gate where um, activity cannot be propagated because inhibition is so fast and so strong by a synaptic, uh, uh, if you want, uh, a bias towards inhibition, as wider axons, synapses made earlier, more, more synapses made, that you could have a shut gate. And such a triadic circuit with a shut gate configuration by inhibition could in principle compensate for this uh, law where uh, inhibition needs an action potential to, to become active and could be a configuration in which um, certain activity processes are encoded by these kind of triadic configurations as shown here, and then could be um, locked, could be unlocked by either disinhibition or additional contextual or uh, sensory input um, that, I, uh, that could then lead these shut gates to open. Now, this may seem very simplistic, but it's actually a potentially very powerful way of encoding hypotheses, right? That you could essentially lay down all that could happen from the current state of uh, the world but you don't use uh, neuronal activity to actually run through all these possibilities. They are there in, if you want, silent anatomy, and they are shut by inhibition. But when you disinhibit or when you add more excitation, that is context potentially, then you start activating those hypothesis uh, circuits that make sense in the current world. And these are uh, ideas of how to analyze data um, uh, that comes from connectomic analysis of uh, mouse cortex in particular, uh, even at scale. So we are now using larger um, and faster microscopes to get to what you would consider an entire cortical column connectome. And this is just the outlook. Um, so we are now able to um, reconstruct uh, circuits at the level of a cortical column, about 10,000 neurons. And this is, of course, the place where we can now really ask about individual learning, processing, um, uh, circuits, so to say, that are there to process this information efficiently. And as mentioned earlier, it's not enough to do this in mouse. We need to do this in human, as we are also pursuing right now, because I think this evolutionary scale is uh, incredibly important uh, to understand what happens the more uh, the individual is able to adapt to the world compared to uh, species where it's primarily about surviving in a world that has been around for millions of years, exactly like that already. And for this, mouse, uh, mouse cortical column is already quite a step forward, but human cortical column is ahead of us and even larger um, uh, circuits. Um, with that, we, I hope that we will uh, be able to answer questions about how knowledge combines with sensory information. I outlined very briefly and unfortunately a little bit interrupted by uh, my technology, um, uh, the strategy we are pursuing uh, using electron microscopy and uh, hopefully we'll learn something about how to compute that may be better than uh, von Neumann architecture and current AI. With that, here's some summary statements. Uh, and I thank you very much for your patience and your uh, interest in this work. Thank you very much indeed, Moritz, uh, for uh, a beautiful and uh, exciting talk.